Hey guys, in this video I'm going to take you through some really, really hard questions for your AQA Biology Paper 1. Now what I've done is I've written the questions, you can go and download those from my website, and I've taken you through the mark scheme. So the key things that the examiner is going to be looking for. Good luck guys. On the face of it, these questions might not look too complicated, but when we delve deep into exactly what the examiners are looking for, there are actually lots of different layers to this, and they can be much more complicated than they seem. I'm looking through how to do all of these questions, pointing out to you the sort of thing that examiners are going to be looking for. Compare the functions of organelles in plants and animal cells. Now compare. For a compare question, we need to find the similarities. and the differences. Here we have our plant and animal cells. And if you want to copy these pictures that so you can annotate yourself, don't forget that is in the free version guide, which you can get from my website. This question can be answered in two detailed paragraphs. One addressing similarities, one addressing the differences. So both plant and animal cells have, let's start with the nuclei. And then you can explain what the nuclei does. The nuclei. This holds the DNA and controls the cell. Then we can move on to the mitochondria, shown here in pink. And mitochondria is responsible for turning um, sugar into energy, so that's where respiration takes place. These tiny little black dots that you can see all over there are not a dirty screen, these are the ribosomes. And these are responsible for producing proteins. They make the proteins from the amino acid chains. Around the edge, they both have a cell membrane. And that is going to control what goes in and out of the cell. And then one that everyone forgets, all over the place in the side here, we have the cytoplasm. And this is where the reactions take place. So that covers everything that they have um, in common. And plant cells have a number of organelles that are not found in animal cells. For example, this here is a large vacuole. And that is going to be responsible for shape and structure. We have here chloroplasts. And they um, is where photosynthesis takes place. And then the last thing around our plant cell is going to be our cell wall. This is important for structure. Um, so it's going to stop the cell popping, basically. 
exactly, keeping it rigid, um, keeping it the right shape. So you have the important differences in between plant and animal cells and their function, and the nuclei, mitochondria, ribosomes, cell membrane, and cytoplasm. Describe mitosis. For mitosis to happen, we need to have the cell growing to a certain size. We need to have cell growth. It needs to be happily growing. Then we need the DNA to divide, to um, replicate, sorry. So there are two copies of each chromosome. These chromosomes sort themselves up, attach them to the pole, and the chromosomes line up down the middle. Once they are equally attached to either side, then the cell can start to separate, the chromosomes will separate, and one chromosome will move to either side. The cell can now divide, and we have two identical daughter cells. For this, we are going to need to have each part of the process in order. Describe how an enzyme works. An enzyme has an active site, which is very specific, I hate that word, so specific for a substrate. The substrate will fit into active sites. And when it's in the active site, it will either break it down or make it into something new. Enzyme will then release the products. And the enzyme can be used again and again and again. An examiner will be looking for every single one of these points to be mentioned in a question. Describe the path that the blood takes through the heart. Here is our beautiful picture of the heart. 
And there is a copy of this again in the free revision guide if you want to annotate this and follow along. So we are going to go in here, down here, up here, to the lungs, back through here, in here, up and out. But we need to write that a little bit properly. So the first thing you do is you write right and left on your paper to remind yourself that the heart is the other way round. The blood is going to come in here through the vena cava. It is going to move down. to the right atrium. It is going to pass through a valve and the valve's job is to stop the blood flowing backwards and it is going to pass through into the right ventricle. It is going to go from there out this way to the lungs and this is going to be the pulmonary artery. Arteries leave the heart, veins go into the heart. When it is at the lungs, it picks up oxygen. So we're going to see this shift here from the blue deoxygenated blood to the red oxygenated blood. It is going to re-enter via the pulmonary vein. The pulmonary vein is the only vein that carries oxygenated blood and the pulmonary artery is the only artery that carries deoxygenated blood. Once it has re-entered the heart, it is going to go into the left atrium, move down through the valve into the left ventricle and then it is going to get pumped to the rest of the body via the aorta. So down from the right atrium, left atrium, into the left ventricle and up and out to the body via the aorta. You'll notice here that this muscle on the left side is much larger than the muscle on the right side. That is because this muscle down here on the right side only has to pump the blood a little way to the lungs, whereas over here the blood from the left ventricle has to be pumped all the way around the body down to the farthest reaches of your toes and have enough pump to get all the way back up again. A quick little handy tip to help you work out um, if you've got everything in the right order is that your path should go V A V A V A V A A burger is eaten for lunch. Describe how the different parts of the digestive system act on this to break it down. There is quite a lot going on in this question. When we're answering this question we need to think about the mechanical digestion and the enzyme digestion. A large part of the mechanical digestion is done in the mouth with the teeth breaking food down. The stomach will also go um, undergo mechanical digestion as it churns things up. 
there are a few different enzymes we need to think about. Amylase, that is going to turn carbohydrates into sugars. Lipase, that turns fats into fatty acids. And glycerol and protease takes proteins and turns them into amino acids. All of these are produced in pan the pancreas. but they act in different places. So amylase is produced and acts in the mouth and the small intestine. Protease is the stomach and the small intestine. And then lipase is also in the small intestine. There is another chemical that is involved, bile, that is going to be produced in the liver and stored in the bile duct. It does two things. It is added after the stomach, so it neutralises stomach acid, so that it doesn't damage the small intestine, and it emulsifies which means it breaks them down to give them a larger surface area. Once all the different parts have been broken down, the bun and the burger, all the carbohydrates, the fats and the proteins, it can move through the small intestine. Remember, the small intestine has a large surface area so it can absorb lots of things. The um, mush will then move through to the large intestine where the water will be reabsorbed. You can't talk about digestion unless you are talking about both the mechanical parts of digestion, the enzyme parts of digestion, what they do, where they are produced, and what bile does. All of these are important parts of the digestive system. Describe how the structure of the intestine is adapted to suit its function. There are two parts to our intestine, the small intestine and the large intestine. The small intestine absorbs all of the food, the goodies from that, and the large intestine reabsorbs water. Only very small food particles can pass from the small intestine to the bloodstream so it's important that they are broken down now this is mainly done at this stage in the small intestine by the various different enzymes there are three key features to the structure of the small intestine, which means it is very good at its function. It has thin walls, so that the food can easily pass through. It has a very large blood supply. When I mean large, I mean long. Um, there's lots and lots of it. And there are villi which means it has a large surface area. So this here that I've shaded in blue is where the food is. That is the inside of the small intestine. And you can see there are very, very thin walls which are going to allow food particles to pass from here, through here, into this very long this very um, extensive supply of blood, which will carry it around the rest of the body. Instead of just being a flat surface, there are these villi that poke up, giving it a large surface area, meaning more feed is able to pass through.
An examiner would be looking for the three specific parts of the small intestine that makes it very good at its function, how the food is broken down here, and what size and what particles are going to be transmitted. Explain how factors may limit the rate of photosynthesis. Whenever you see a question on photosynthesis, it is always a good idea to start with the equation. Carbon dioxide plus water. We put light at the top because it is in presence of light, but light is not a reactant. makes oxygen and glucose. If you're going to stretch yourself and write down the symbol equation, make sure you get it correct. So there has to be little um, numbers down here, little numbers down here, otherwise it is not correct. And then you have to balance the equation, but this one is a fairly easy one to remember. So when we're looking at this reaction, there are going to be a few things that limit the rate of photosynthesis. It is going to be supply of the reactant, so carbon dioxide and water, the amount of light, the temperature will also affect it, and the um, amount of chlorophyll that's available. Now the situation is slightly more complicated than just one thing affecting the level of photosynthesis at a time. Because in reality, you're going to have different temperatures, different water levels, different carbon dioxide levels, all um, intermixing to have an effect on how much photosynthesis takes place. So here we're going to look at a graph. We have rate of photosynthesis, or how much photosynthesis is going on at the side, and then our variable carbon dioxide, in this case, down at the bottom. As the levels of carbon dioxide increase, we are going to see a start of the rate of photosynthesis increasing as well. But this will only happen up to a certain point. After a certain point, the rate of photosynthesis will not increase any more with an increase in the rate of carbon dioxide. This is because at this point, other things will start to be limiting factors, like the temperature, the availability of water, the availability of chlorophyll. This shape of graph is also the same for water, light, and chlorophyll. Increasing levels of any of them will increase the rate of photosynthesis as they increase, but only up to a certain point, whereupon other things will become limiting factors. The graph of how temperature affects photosynthesis looks slightly different. When we have low temperatures, we are not going to have very much photosynthesis. Around the optimal temperature, there will be a large amount of photosynthesis, but again, if it gets too hot, then that photosynthesis won't be happening. We need to remember um, that everything in biology, chemistry, mostly is controlled by proteins. So if a protein is too low, there isn't going to be enough energy for the reaction to take place. The rate of reaction is going to be too high. Whereas if it gets too high, then the proteins are going to start to be denatured and we're not going to get um, a reaction taking place as a protein won't be working. There is quite a lot in this question, and if we're talking about factors that limit rate of synthesis, we have to be looking at all of them. The equation is always going to be important. Then we can start to look at the graphs. For any of these graphs, you need to have a two-part graph and explain what is going on. For temperature, we have a three-part graph and explaining what is going on at each point. Explain how oxygen debt occurs and how it can be repaid. Oxygen debt occurs when we have anaerobic respiration. It is going to be glucose being broken down without oxygen because it's anaerobic into lactic acid. And there is going to be energy release but not much.
Our product is going to be lactic acid, not the carbon dioxide and water that would occur from aerobic respiration. It is only going to give about 5% of the energy that aerobic respiration would give. And this type of respiration is going to happen during sprints um, when the body doesn't have time to get the oxygen around to the muscles. If you have a buildup of lactic acid, that's going to lead to muscle fatigue. That can be incredibly, incredibly painful. So the lactic acid needs to be removed. This is going to be the lactic acid is a product of incomplete breakdown of glucose, and this will lead to our oxygen debt. Because what we need to happen is we need a large amount of oxygen to take the lactic acid. and complete the breakdown of glucose into carbon dioxide and water. Now you're going to be breathing very heavily after you have done exercise. This is because you need to get a large amount of oxygen to your muscles. You also need to get rid of a large amount of carbon dioxide and you need to have your blood flowing so it can move the oxygen to your muscles and the carbon dioxide away from your muscles. There are a few key things in here, so you need to mention anaerobic respiration and the equation and that very little energy is released. It is the incomplete breakdown of oxygen that leads to oxygen jets and oxygen is needed to complete the breakdown of glucose. Using examples, compare how bacteria, viruses and fungi make you ill. There are two important things to note in this question. Using examples means you have to give examples. And compare means we need similarities and differences. So, our similarities, they are all very small pathogens then invade the body. Bacteria, E. coli, that can give you something like food poisoning and they produce toxins and these toxins are what's going to make you feel really ill. That's going to give you kind of like your stomach bug. That's going to make you feel very unwell. Viruses invade cells. Reproduce. And then um, when they get to a certain level, they will explode out of the cell, killing it. And the high level of cell death is what will make you feel ill. Fungi feed off the body. So something like athlete's foot or a yeast infection will take things away that the cells need and that is what will make you feel ill. So a few key points here that might have tripped you up. You can't just say bacteria will make you feel ill by releasing toxins because you have to have had um, examples and you have to have similarities as well. So you can get one mark for each of these, providing you have given an example. How do vaccines work? When you have an injection or drops for your vaccination, there is going to be a small dead or inactive amount of the pathogen. So this won't make you very ill, it won't give you the disease, but you may get some side effects from that, like um, a red patch, a bit of soreness, maybe a headache, but you path the vaccine shouldn't make you seriously ill. What this does is it allows the white blood cells
to recognise and to get to know the pathogen. It can start to build up a store of antibodies against the pathogen. So that next time when you're infected, your body can react faster. Because it already has the antibodies. It doesn't build, need to build new ones because it already has them. And because it can react faster, this should prevent you from getting seriously ill. You may still get a small infection, but it wouldn't be anywhere near as serious um, as if you had not had the vaccination. You need to say that it's a dead or inactive part of the pathogen, that is the white blood cells in the immune system. They will recognise the pathogen and develop antibodies against it. And then when you are exposed to it in the future, your body will react faster, preventing you from getting seriously ill. Ouch! This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches.